Although the main reason I did is because I'm dying for a chance to command a battalion. Lieutenant Colonel James Anderson is an aide to General Creighton Abrams, the overall U.S. military commander in Vietnam. Seven years after serving as an advisor to the Arvin, Anderson now prepares to take command of an American battalion. General Abrams turned to me one night at the dinner table and he said, Jim, he said, why don't you take command of that battalion? It was almost as though to say, uh, okay, wise guy, you seem to have all the answers. Why don't you, won't you go show me? And I said, I'd love to take command of that battalion. Anderson will soon discover just how important unifying his men is. The door to battalion headquarters opens, and in walk a bunch of generals. They swear me to secrecy and get right to the point. How long before you can be, be prepared, prepared to make, make a combat, combat assault, assault into, Cambodia? into Cambodia? And I said, are we talking about in terms of hours, days, weeks, months? And they said, we're talking about hours. For years, the North Vietnamese have used neighboring Cambodia as a refuge. Much of the Ho Chi Minh Trail runs through the country, and large stores of enemy weapons and supplies are hidden along the border. But since the start of hostilities, U.S. policy has prohibited its ground troops from entering the country for risk of widening the war. In early 1970, however, President Nixon sees a window of opportunity when the Cambodian leader, Noradum Shayanuk, is ousted by the pro-American general Lan Nol. Despite the political risk, Nixon decides a chance at destroying the NVA's capacity to launch assaults into South Vietnam is worth the gamble, and so he issues top secret orders, sending US troops into Cambodia. It's like a shot of adrenaline straight into my vein. Within hours, hundreds of soldiers are assembling. Massive amounts of ammo and supplies are being flown in and distributed. No one can contain their excitement. We've been waiting a long time for this. A chance to cross that forbidden line and see what's on the other side. We're finally going into Cambodia. I haven't slept in almost 24 hours, and yet I feel more awake now than I ever have in my life. Lieutenant Colonel James Anderson is leading his battalion from the 1st Air Cavalry into Cambodia. Ahead of them stretch waves of tactical fighters and B-52 bombers, while below race mile-long columns of mechanized infantry and armor. Altogether, 30,000 U.S. troops are poised for action. Their mission is twofold. First, decimate enemy sanctuaries and disrupt NVA supply lines along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And second, attempt to find and destroy the communist military command center known as Kozvin, which is rumored to be located in the Fishhook region. As soon as we hit the ground and get organized, we move out. I don't intend to waste any time finding what the enemy has been hiding. It doesn't take long. Within two hours, we come across a massive enemy training and supply dump. Right away, the guys start calling it the city because it has almost everything you could imagine that you would have in a city. That you would have in a city, any place else. You had schools, you had hospitals. 
you had ammunition storage areas. I don't know how many tons, hundreds of tons of rice that were in there. I was shocked that they had it, that it was that large and it was that close to the, uh, to the border. I don't think uh, we were more than seven, seven miles, seven miles into Cambodia. Cambodia. So if there's that much here, I can only imagine how much is out there. There's so many supplies, it'll take months to destroy it all. And the last thing I want to do is get so hung up with this that we fail our primary objective. So I order two of my rifle companies to stay back at the city and oversee its destruction. While I take the other three companies and head out to find the NVA headquarters. While Anderson and his men speed towards their objective, President Nixon prepares to deal with a political problem, the uproar that the news will surely provoke. He decides to take the offensive so he can frame the issue before others do. Tonight, American and South Vietnamese units will attack the headquarters for the entire communist military operation in South Vietnam. This is not an invasion of Cambodia. The areas in which these attacks will be launched are completely occupied and controlled by North Vietnamese forces. We take this action not for the purpose of expanding the war into Cambodia, but for the purpose of ending the war in Vietnam and winning the just peace we all desire. The day after Nixon's announcement, student protests break out on dozens of campuses across the country. On May 4th, 2,000 students rally at Kent State. As the demonstration erupts into violence, members of the Ohio National Guard suddenly open fire on the crowd of students. In 13 seconds, 67 live rounds are fired. Four students are killed, eight more are wounded, one permanently paralyzed. Public reaction is horrified and widespread. Four million students go on strike, forcing 450 colleges, universities, and high schools to shut down. Ever since I came back from Vietnam, I've been trying to push this war out of my mind. But seeing this makes me realize I can't keep quiet anymore. Two years earlier, Barry Romo returned home from Vietnam with the body of his nephew, Robert, who was killed in action after the Tet Offensive. I can't lie to myself anymore because this war isn't ending. So I grab a buddy of mine who served with me over there, and we put on, put on our fatigues that we had worn in Vietnam, and we still had them, and they still fit. And we went to the anti-draft so anti rally. rally. And as I'm looking around at all those faces of those kids, all the frustration and the anger and the loss that I've been feeling boils up inside of me. I don't care what the hell anyone thinks or what anyone says. This has got to end. This has got to end now. So I jump up and I start telling all these kids that if they're brave enough to burn their draft cards and risk going to jail, well, then I support them. Because I've had enough fighting, enough killing, and enough of this war. I felt liberating. I felt like someone had taken 10,000 tons off my shoulder. I no longer was bearing the burden of, of uh, Richard Nixon and, and, and Lyndon Johnson's sins that, uh, that I was taking a good stand and a, a manly stand and a, and a, and a human, human stand, stand and a purposeful stand. With the country tearing itself apart, 
President Nixon issues a directive curtailing the scope and length of the mission in Cambodia. He pledges that U.S. forces will advance no further than 19 miles into the country and sets June 30th as the date all American troops will return to South Vietnam. According to our intelligence, we're less than three miles from the North Vietnamese headquarters, meaning we'll be there before nightfall. But just as we're closing in on our objective, I get a call from division headquarters telling me to halt in place. Do not go any further. Don't go any further. Doesn't make any sense to me tactically. And I was pretty upset about it. I called and I said, who in the hell is making this kind of dumb decision? You know, I'm within five kilometers of my objective and we can be there by nightfall. I said, uh, what's going on? And well, finally, the division commander got on the phone and said, Anderson, shut up and listen. Your orders are halt in place. Don't go any further. I found out later that President Nixon reported to the American people our that our in objectives Cambodia in Cambodia are limited. Limited. were limited. I'm absolutely speechless. For the first time in a long time, it seemed like we were finally using some common sense in this war. Now, I'm not sure what the hell we're doing. <laughs> 